In this video series, we have been studying regression with mixed variable types, and we focused on a way to analyze data with such a design, and it is called analysis of covariance, or ANCOVA. Here are some considerations when performing ANCOVA. The primary goal is to increase power by reducing error variation. Probably the most commonly misunderstood goal of ANCOVA is that it is a way of equating groups that differ on an extraneous variable, a covariate, when in fact we should not have differences on that extraneous variable. If we can randomize in order to remove systematic bias, all the better. And then the covariate can be used to reduce the residual and therefore increase power. A secondary goal is to adjust for a covariate if, and I'm emphasizing if, that covariate has similar representation in the levels of the explanatory variable. As I have discussed in this video series, if it does not, then we are going to be extrapolating beyond the range of the data that we're actually observing, and that can lead to some pretty peculiar consequences. I would invite you to do a web search for Lord's Paradox. And what you'll find if you find Lord's Paradox, and you should find numerous hits on that, is that when analysis of covariance is conducted on groups that are very much different on the extraneous variable, the covariate, you can in fact arrive at conclusions that are the opposite of the conclusions that you should actually arrive at. So you need to be very wary of adjustment. And the only reason to do adjustment is if you find the covariate does have similar representation in the levels of the explanatory variable. So when we saw that there were some differences, we did some further analysis to make sure that we weren't going to come up with unwarranted conclusions by analyzing the data with ANCOVA. ANCOVA is often misused to compare groups that differ on a quantitative covariate. ANCOVA is best suited for experimental situations and observational settings when pre-study conditions include comparable covariate variation among groups. So I've gone through all the steps in analysis of covariance in previous videos, but now I'm ready to take on my challenge. I want to analyze the ethnic income data to determine if there are income differences among ethnic groups, even after accounting for years of education. We've done this, but I did not put it in a report format, which is something that I've done here now. And let's look through my report. The first thing is I'm going to, since I have the description in the description, what I'm going to study, the first thing is, is I'm going to go ahead and remove this little statement of research, the purpose of the research that I put there just to introduce this particular video. So let me go ahead and re-knit and let's take a look and see how it looks. And maybe there will be places along the way I'll need to make corrections. That's okay. Here's the description. The phrase equal pay for equal work would seem to be a logical expression of fairness. Unfortunately, the data from American workers does not always reflect this philosophy. For this study, I will use data from a stratified random survey of workers from three different racial or ethnic groups, black, Hispanic, and white. So I've already put something in this description that I had forgotten about that was true of the data that I found in the research literature, and that is that they stratified so that they were able to get uh, people from the three groups from various income levels when they took their sample. That's a good thing that helped equate the income levels in the study, although as we saw when we were analyzing it earlier, it did not do it completely. The purpose of the study is to determine if income is related to race or ethnicity. Higher levels of education often are associated with higher pay. So I will take years of education into account when analyzing the data. And then I make my true confession here. The data used in this study are real data from a reliable source, but the reference for the data has been misplaced and is still being sought until the reference is found. The year of these data is unknown. 
Now we'll start the analysis. The box plots in figure one illustrate the range of annual incomes for black, Hispanic, and white workers. These data suggest a clear difference in incomes, especially when comparing white workers to black and Hispanic workers. So we can see here, and we've discussed that earlier, and you'll notice that after reading in the data here, that here is where I created the box plot, and you saw this code in an earlier video. Table one is the five number summaries, means, and standard deviations for income in the three ethnic groups. These data suggest that Hispanic incomes are slightly above those of black workers and white incomes are substantially above those of workers in the other two groups. And white incomes also have much higher variation due to more salaries on the high end. And so here's the table of statistics, again, created using the code that I showed you in an earlier video. The primary purpose of this study is to determine if incomes are still discrepant among racial or ethnic groups, even after taking years of education into account. If there are educational differences among the groups, some of the income discrepancies could potentially be explained by these differences. Figure two illustrates the years of education for the three groups with three side-by-side -side box plots. Years of education are similar for white and black workers. There is much less variation and a lower central, central tendency for years of education of Hispanic workers in the United States. So here are the box plots. Remember that when I went through in a previous video, I went ahead and looked at this as a one-factor analysis of variance and actually saw if we can make inferences. But that was for pedagogical reasons to compare and contrast the An ANOVA with ANCOVA. Here I'm going right to looking at the covariate and the relationship of the covariate to my explanatory variable. And then I give the descriptive statistics. And after I do that, I move down to looking at the inferences that we need or will need for ANCOVA. Now, the other thing that we might have put in here that I didn't, but we're gonna see it in the scatter plot later on, is we could have looked also at the covariate education and looked at that as it related to income. You'll remember in a previous video that I did that, that I showed you a scatter plot. But ultimately, I'm going to get to that scatter plot down here, and so I didn't bother to show it at this point. But it's always good to make sure, if you're not certain, that the covariate is related to the response measure. So now I get down here. Further analysis of these data through analysis of covariance assumes there is no interaction of education and race. That is, we need to determine the relationship of education to race is similar for the three groups. A model that includes education, race, and the interaction results in the conclusion that no interaction can be inferred to the general population. And again, I'll warn you, and I say it here, I've not conclusively shown there is no interaction, but I will proceed making a reasonable assumption that any interaction of these two variables, education and race, is small enough to be ignored. At least we were not able to make inferences with the data in this study. Now, where does that P equals 0.024 come from? I actually conducted that analysis right down here. And, but you notice that I used the include equals false so that that analysis would appear over here in my, um, over in here, my console window. So I could steal that 0.24, but I didn't show the ANOVA table. I just reported the p-value there. There is no reason to show the whole ANOVA table when we're only focused on the interaction. Figure three is a residual fit plot to assess linearity and homoscedasticity when modeling income from education and race without interaction. This plot suggests a slight curvilinear relationship as well as heteroscedasticity with higher variation of residuals for higher predicted income. So here we see higher variation of residuals and here we see that there, this is not really a straight line. There is a slight curvilinear relationship. 
Figure four is a normal QQ plot of residuals. The standardized scores for the residuals when predicting high salaries are even higher than we would expect if the data followed a normal distribution. Now, this is a slight concern, but not as much of a concern as the heterostatistic because we have 80 observations. Remember, when you have enough observations that even if your data are not normally distributed, your coefficients or your statistics will follow a normal distribution in their sampling distributions if we have a big enough sample size. And here I'm stating we have 80 observations. That number of observations does nothing, though, in order to deal with our heteroscedastic variances that we saw in the residual versus fit table. Table three is the analysis of covariance. Did I say anything to? No, I, I guess I haven't yet said anything about cautions about inference. That's coming later. Table three is the analysis of covariance table to determine inference for the factors in the study. And I don't know why I said split plot design. It's not a split plot design. So that was a little error that crept in there. So I'm going to take that out. I warned you this might happen. Um, so let's take this out. Table three is the analysis of covariance table to determine inference for factors in the study. And that's it. Okay. So and then... I will knit this again. All right, and going down here, I say education is clearly related to income, and I'm giving that tiny, tiny number. No, it has how close to zero that is. E to the minus 11. Uh, so we move the decimal place 11 places to the left, have 10 zeros before the four. Yet we cannot infer with 95% confidence that there are income differences across the ethnic groups once we control for education, P equals 0.052. After accounting for race, for every year increase in education, there's an average increase of approximately $4,400 in annual income. Fitting three, in other words, I'm looking at the slope the overall slope of the regression line. So if you go back here, you'll see that when I started talking about that, that I was actually getting out here. Let me run everything above and then run this. I'm actually getting out all these coefficients and there's the slope. So the slope is the same for all groups. That was one of the conditions for, for um, proper interpretation here. So that's why I'm saying what I am, if I find it again here, that's why that after accounting for race for every year increase in education, there's an average increase of approximately $4,400. Why accounting for race? Because those slopes are formed separately for each of the races. It's the same slope, but they're a within race slope. In order to not account for race, I would actually look at the slopes if I were to take this data here and put one line through all the points. Fitting three regression lines to our data suggests that after accounting for education, average annual income is 5,941 higher for Hispanic workers than for black workers and 10,874 higher for white workers than for black workers. Where did that come from? The numbers over here, these coefficients over here. So I didn't show the printing of those coefficients, but I'm using them in my narrative. Figure five illustrates the relationship of education and income. So that's why I was telling you before we would show that scatter plot here. And it's showing it for each of the three racial or ethnic groups because we have a legend here indicating different color and style points for each of the groups. Our primary research question is whether there are differences in annual income among these three ethnic groups, even after accounting for education. The answer is yes for our sample, though we did not have enough information to infer to the population. So don't leave telling people I was unable to infer to the population. Therefore, there's no difference in income after accounting for education. No, we found a difference. It's just we don't have enough stability of our estimates to be able to make inference. This figure accentuates the earlier finding that inference is suspect with these data. Note the representation up here of higher income levels with white workers with no representation in the other two groups. There's actually one, one here that is in black group, but that's not a person at the higher income level. The income levels stop 
Look at this. They stop at about $70,000 is where they stop with the Hispanic and black workers, but there's more higher incomes here with the white workers. In future studies, we may want to either restrict the study to certain types of occupations or make certain there is a representation among all racial or ethnic groups at various salary levels if this is possible. The adjusted annual mean salary, where does that come from? That came from my last co-chunk here in which I did the adjustment as I described in a previous video. So that adjusted mean salary for the three groups is about 30,000 for black workers, 36,000 for Hispanic workers, and about 41,000 for white workers. Now I'm ready for my conclusions. The, the regular conclusions I can make technical, but the press release needs to be non-technical. This study used income data from three racial ethnic groups to try to answer the question about whether annual income is the same for the three groups once we account for years of education. The answer for our sample is no, it is not, though we cannot infer this answer to the general population. For the sample data, after accounting for race, for every year increase in education, there is an average increase of approximately $4,400 in annual income. Even though this is true across ethnic groups, there are differences among these groups, even after accounting for education. Average annual income is about 6,000 higher for Hispanic workers than for black workers, and about 11,000 higher for white workers than for black workers. Here's the press release. A study of income among American workers has found that race or ethnicity may play a factor in income differences, even after accounting for education. It is clear from this study that education does make a difference in salary. In fact, each year of additional education resulted in an average salary increase of $4,400. Now remember, part of that is based upon assuming equal slopes for e each of my groups. If that's a non-reasonable assumption, we need to use a different technique than classic an ANCOVA. Yet even accounting for education, white workers have higher annual salaries than either black or Hispanic workers. Hispanic workers make an education adjusted income that is about 6,000 higher than black workers. White workers have an education adjusted income that is almost 11,000 higher than black workers. Researchers caution, however, that even though these findings are valid for participants in the study, further research is needed to ascertain whether similar findings will hold for the general population of American workers. That is, I'm basically saying in non-technical terms, we can't make inferences outside of the study at this time. So that is ANCOVA, a very powerful and if misused, very dangerous procedure. So use with caution and take advantage of the smaller residual error by removing error variation due to a covariate and this can be a good tool when used correctly.